Excuse me, I'd like to begin by thanking Shabir Mirza uh, for inviting me to deliver a valedictory talk for this conference on multidisciplinarity. I would also like to thank Professor Dr. Rui Jan Kant uh, and other members of the administration of the Government College for Women, uh, as well as the um, um, members of the organizing committee for this conference. Shabir explained that for purposes of this talk, the relevant focus of the conference is gender and literary study. As some of you may know, my own research and teaching has focused on the multidisciplinary intersection of literary study with cognitive and affective science. Moreover, one of the topics I have addressed in this framework is gender, most intensively in my 2018 book, Sexual Identities, a Cognitive Literary Study. I am particularly interested in how literature can advance our understanding of human cognition and emotion, and the ways that an integrated study of these fields can further our comprehension of politics and ethics. Clearly, there is not much I can say about any of these topics in a 20-minute pre presentation, but I should like to briefly consider some aspects of gender and virtue. Now let's see if I can get these slides to advance. Okay. Um, first section is called Politics and Feeling. It begins with an epigraph from Laleshwari. Shiva abides in all that is. Sorry. Shiva abides in all that is everywhere. Then do not discriminate between a Hindu or a Muslim. At the end of my book on Kashmir, I present a list of 25 measures that might improve conditions for Kashmiri people, suffering as they are from several kinds of armed violence. Some of, these measure, some of the measures that I urge are obvious, such as following international law. Others may be more surprising. This is the ninth recommendation. Vigorously pursue gender equality, first in terms of basic health and well-being. Jessica Stern points out that, quote, countries with a high ratio of males to females are significantly more prone to violence. The 2011 census of India the most recent census uh, available to me when I was writing the book, shows that Jammu and Kashmir state has a ratio of 883 females to 1,000 males, a decline since the beginning of the insurgency, despite the numbers of young men killed over those decades. For comparison, India as a whole has 940 females for 1,000 males, and the United States has 1,025 females for 1,000 males. Clearly, the same gender equality policies should be pursued elsewhere in India as well. Such a disproportion is presumably due to a higher mortality rate for girls than boys. Ideally, such equality would address ideological issues as well. Often the rage-provoking humiliation suffered by young men involves a sense of gender inadequacy what Jessica Stern, as Jessica Stern refers to it, quote, wounded masculinity, unquote. The best response to this is not making men feel more manly, but instead working to destigmatize so-called feminine traits so that a man's association with femininity is not humiliating, and the default response to humiliation of, of other sorts is not an assertion of hypermasculinity. I'm sure that you all agree that equality of the sexes is a desirable goal in, it, in itself. But why is such equality also desirable in reducing civil conflict? There are presumably other contributory factors, but this correlation seems to, to derive in part from the different virtues associated with men and women, particularly the virtues that bear on violence. Come on, advance. There we go. Oh, no, no. There it goes. 
Before going on, I should explain that I'm using the term gender in the sense of psychological traits and behavioral dispositions that are commonly associated with one sex. I do not believe that gender is predominantly or even largely innate. Indeed, I am very skeptical about most claims of gender differences, even when they are not claimed to be innate. Rather, I agree with writers such as Cordelia Fine, whose arguments and, and um, analyses suggest that the traits and dispositions we think of as feminine or masculine are to a great extent either misattributed, exaggerated, situational, or formed through processes of socialization. More precisely, I am highly skeptical that there is any necessary connection between sex, that is being male or female, and gender, that is being masculine or feminine, hence the title of this talk. I also believe that any contingent connections are limited and alterable. Nonetheless, it does seem that the clustering of some virtues into two sets is, in some cases, not accidental. There seems to be, in other words, a natural tendency for some virtues to aggregate into two groups that we into the two groups that we commonly think of as masculine and feminine. In saying this, I am referring specifically to those moral virtues that bear on violence, or more broadly, the infliction of harm on others. Following the narrative, the narrative typology of moral virtues set out in my uh, book. Sorry, I've lost the cursor here. There we go. Okay. There we go. So follow, <clears throat> following the narrative typology of moral virtues set out in my book, Literature and Moral Feeling, we might refer to these two aggregates as heroic and familial ethical orientations. In that book, I argue that our moral values tend to be associated with preferred story structures or genres. One ideal of the heroic genre, for example, is bravely risking physical suffering or death for the sake of the in-group, typically through violent conflict. A roughly parallel ideal from the familial genre is undergoing emotional suffering for the sake of one's family, typically through nonviolent self-denial, for example, setting aside personal ambitions for the sake of some family member, such as a child. In addition to story genres, we may understand, eth and understand ethical preferences as guided in part by the sorts of situation we ourselves face in daily life. Suppose we are asked about the main concerns of ethics. We may articulate certain types of principles if we tacitly call to mind processes governing hiring decisions or the distribution of salary increments. For example, if we have just come from a department meeting but we may formulate very different principles if we implicitly apply our selection to raising children or nursing the terminally ill. The narrative genre and personal experience accounts of ethical preference are not mutually exclusive. Moreover, both seem compatible with our various ideas about ethics, including those that bear on responses to violence. It seems clear that heroic employment is traditionally linked with men more than women, while the reverse is true for familial employment. There are, also life con there are also life contexts that are similarly divided. But these points most obviously address particular ethical, particular ethical decisions as they are oriented by narrative structures and experiential contexts. They do not so clearly explain the division of virtues, which at least the story genres might be viewed as, viewed as expressing rather than as guiding. Consider, for example, research on empathy. Oh, I seem to have gotten ahead of myself by one bullet point. Well, anyway, uh, empathy is often conceived of as a specifically feminine virtue. And indeed, women appear to exhibit more, to exhibit more empathy 
even in controlled experimental settings. But there's a complication here. As it turns out, men are less likely than women to empathize and act on empathy spontaneously. However, when placed in circumstances where empathy is prized and they are thereby motivated to empathize, men no longer show an empathy deficiency relative to women. This would seem to suggest that the gender difference in empathy is, at least to a great extent, the product of ideological and structural divisions, which assign, for example, the labor of child rearing to women and the labor of fighting wars to men. Presumably similar points hold with respect to other gendered virtues beyond empathy, physical bravery, an inclination to be confrontational or conciliatory, and so on. Thus, we are left with the question of why actual virtues such as empathy may follow a pattern of being capacities shared more or less equally across the sexes, but not expressed with the same spontaneous frequency. This last issue becomes even more vexing when we consider that the virtues at issue, distributed into their confrontational and conciliatory or antipathetic and empathetic aggregates, are not quite parallel. Many of us have the intuitive sense that there is a problem with mas so-called masculine virtues. In common parlance, this intuition is signaled by the phrase toxic man masculinity. As far as I am aware, there is no such thing as toxic feminine femininity. If there is, it is much rarer than toxic masculinity. Uh, the next section is called Rabindranath Tagore's First Person Ethics. It too begins with a short uh, epigraph from uh, Laleshwari. When, when can I break the bonds of shame? Quote, unquote. Affective psychology, neurology, and other fields of empirical scientific study are crucial for understanding our ethical propensities, how we engage in ethical reasoning, when we act on such reasoning, and so on. Such objective studies might remind us, sorry, oops, everything disappeared. There we go. Mm. Uh, such objective studies might remind us of another division in ethical thought, another kind of clustering. In a, a recent essay, Fairness, Hierarchy, and Moral Rationalization, I refer to this as the division between morality and justice. What underlies this difference, I believe, is a fundamental duality in our experience of and thought about the world. The duality between a first-person stance and a third-person stance, roughly experiential and actuarial, respectively, in this case, a first-person and third-person stance toward ethics, yielding concerns of morality and justice, respectively. I do not wish to discuss this division here. I simply wish to note a rather obvious point, that at least prima facie, the sciences systematize our knowledge about the third-person stance in ethics, our understanding of the first-person stance in contrast, and thereby our comprehension of ethics as a whole, seem likely to be deepened by the complementary study of other types of attention to ethics, prominently those developed in literature and the arts. Of course, the arts are no more infallible or complete than the sciences, but they often recall us to the experiential part of a topic. Thus, the first-person perspective that is of particular importance in ethics, at least to the degree that this is bound up with empathy. <clears throat> Excuse me. It does not seem unreasonable, then, to turn to literature when seeking to resolve the quandaries raised in the preceding section of this paper. A particularly apt case to consider is Rabindranath Tagore's short story, Housewife. The story concerns a teacher of young boys, Shivnath. When the boys do not act in a way he finds appropriate, Shivnath tries to shame them into conformity. One of the most effective weapons in his armory is name-calling. Attributing shameful characteristics to one of the boys, characteristics summarized in a nickname, and provoking the rest of the class to laugh derisively and to taunt his victim. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Tagore explains that one of the boys named Ashu has a younger sister. There are no girls of her age in the neighborhood. Um, as, as there are no girls of her age in, this, in the neighborhood, this sister has no regular playmate. One rainy day, the sister wishes to enact the, cer the marriage ceremony of two of her dolls. Ashu agrees. Tagore clearly suggests that Ashu acted out of spontaneous empathy with his sister, presumably intensified by a feeling of attachment bonding that, <clears throat> that gave his empathic response greater force and greater specificity. By an unfortunate coincidence, Shribnath happens to come, uh, to come upon Ashu with his sister and he sees what they are doing. The following day, Shribnath tells the other boys at school that Ashu spent his day off engaging not in masculine activities, perhaps pulling the wings off insects or kicking small dogs, but in playing at dolls with his little sister. When Ashu arrives at school, he is greeted with the derisive laughter of the class and their chanting of his new nickname, Housewife. Tagore concludes the story with the following sentence. He realized that to play with your little sister on a school holiday was the most shameful thing in the world, and he could not believe that people would ever forget what he had done. Though perhaps obvious to everyone, the point is worth spelling out. The incident serves to create or reinforce a close association in Ashu's mind between shame on the one hand and femininity, empathy, and attachment on the other. The last three, femininity, empathy, and attachment, were probably already associated with one another for Ashu, and if this marked their first association with shame in his mi mind, it, undoubtedly, it was undoubtedly not the last. In addition, research has demonstrated that shame is a volatile emotion. It may manifest itself in a desire to withdraw and hide, but it may lead instead to rage, the usual outcome of which is aggression. Thus, the incident first inhibits Ashu's so-called feminine inclinations toward empathy and attachment care. In this way, the story hints that empathy and attachment care may arise no less spontaneously in males than females, at least in childhood. As to attachment care, Dacher Keltner cites empirical studies consistent with this point. Specifically, quote, recent research finds that both, both parents show elevated levels of oxytocin, the neuropeptide that promotes boundary dissolving openness and connection, six months after the birth of their first child. Of course, Ashu is not, a, not the father, but a sibling. Recalling my own reaction to the appearance of a considerably younger sibling and observing the attachment bonds of my wife's family, where older siblings often had parental roles, I find it intuitively plausible that a new baby could have similar oxytocin elevating effects on older brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, I have not found any research testing this possibility. In any event, this sort of spontaneous inclination toward empathy and detachment care must be stifled in boys if they are going to successfully take up their roles as guardians of violence in the service of social hierarchy. One important social technique for this stifling of empathy is the induction of shame with its frequent concomitant of rage. Through the increased likelihood of rage, shame may also foster the confrontational behavior and anger-based pugnacity that are so often prized in men. This goes at least some way toward explaining the gendering of virtues, which appeared to be something of a puzzle in the preceding section. It also suggests one reason why there might be such a thing as toxic masculinity. If there were time, I would go on to discuss some implications of the preceding analysis. As it is, I need to stop here. But I hope that I have said enough to lead you to reflect further on the issues arising from the relations among virtue, gender, and violence, and how the integration of many disciplines 
is necessary if we wish to gain a better understanding of these issues and ideally to thereby guide action and policy toward resolving conflict in ways that are both humane and just. Thank you.